the other game engines that we use uh, in the second year of our program, we use Unity 3D. And of course you have that nice GUI kind of feel to the game engine. You put your game together. Uh, and of course in programming you still access the C Sharp or the JavaScript to really manipulate the game. But there's a, a level of separation from the actual game engine that I like to have in Panda 3D. Um, this is some of the post-mortem that I had last year uh, that I won't go through because um, the um, last year I had just two hours and basically two hours is just enough to present the material without getting into a multiplayer game. Now hopefully, you know, with uh, it's, I won't go the full three hours today, but I wanted that a little, a little bit of time on the end without anybody coming in saying we need this room right now to, to actually, I have a, uh, a switcher up there and I have some ethernet cables and we, we will take and um, we will actually see the multiplayer game in action. You're welcome to um, come up with your, with your computers. And that reminds me, I have flash drives with the software on it. I'm trying to remember where I put them. And I want to pass them around. Now there is, uh, I have on Google Drive a zip file that um, off so that they don't get lost, but you would, uh, uh, if you wish to copy them on your machine, uh, we, I have the final code version, but just look for the Pi, uh, Pi Ohio 2013 zip file. There might be a, an uncompressed uh, folder there as well that you can uh, just download and avoid the decompression routine. Um, so as I said, uh, the, this is the website of the um, Panda, www.panda3d.org. It has all the manuals and descriptions on how to use Panda 3D. And there are a couple of good textbooks um, published that I have listed there as well that give you some um, some access to uh, some really great concepts on developing games in Panda 3D. Um, this is my information. Um, what I have is a two-year program at Columbus State. We I spend the first uh, two semesters learning Python and Panda 3D. We get into game engines and how games are some of the core concepts of gaming, like loading assets, collisions, uh, user input, how to control player characters with a keyboard and mouse, and uh, then of course the multiplayer concept. And this game kind of grew out of my attempt to try and to um, teach some of those multiplayer concepts, the network concepts that are necessary in creating a network game, a multiplayer game. Uh, Disney, uh, Panda 3D was developed by Disney primarily for its Toontown game maintained by Carnegie Mellon and distributed by Carnegie Mellon. Um, the Using the command prompt console I um, urge people to become accustomed to command line driven 
kinds of, of uh, controls, but actually on the flash drive, when you get into the, the uh, file architecture, you will see that I've also included batch files that accommodate Windows execution. But if you are on Linux, and, and of course Panda 3D is available on Linux, a Linux version, uh, you would be uh, uh, not forced, but certainly urged to use command line driven um, command line driven uh, directives. And simply this, uh, the uh, keyword down there at the bottom, ppython, Panda comes, in, comes distributed with a library of, pan, of uh, Python. I believe it's uh, 264, 2.6.4. So you do, not, you do not need to download Python to run Panda 3D. It comes with its own version and it has its own native command, ppython, which is, uh, which is of course uh, created by Panda to run the Python library. Um, now, I'm going to just introduce some, um, some concepts initially that when you get into uh, Panda 3D, the native camera controls are with the mouse and the right mouse button, you, you can zoom in and out by scrolling it. Uh, the left mouse button is to move horizontally and vertical and the middle mouse button or wheel is to rotate uh, the scene rotate the camera around the uh, scene. Uh, ultimately, this is, what, this is what I'd like to get done today. And that is, we have four stages. Oh, thank you. Uh, we have four stages. I'm going to try and uh, keep them at about a half an hour each so we can get done in two hours. I don't want to keep you for the full till five o'clock tonight. But the stage one is adding objects into the Panda 3D game. Stage two is, is creating the hooks or creating the user input into the uh, controlling the player. Stage three, setting up collisions. Setting up collisions with other objects in the scene and other players. Stage four is wiring our network. Okay. Now, because of the nature that we don't have a, you know, we don't have enough time that you can add this code as we're going, that we can type the code in there. It's, it's not an interactive session, but it, I do include the, uh, in each stage, I include the code that would start the scene, and then you are more than um, of, uh, urged to reverse engineer the final code and see if you can insert the right pieces into the right places. So I have two places for code. There's a folder called final at the top node of that file, and th that is the final code for each stage. So what I, what I like to do and what I encourage my students to do is reverse engineer anything you can find. Get into something that works, find out how it works, and see how you can incorporate that code into something that you want to develop. Um, we're going to be using object-oriented program in Python. Now, I don't want to overwhelm anyone with, the, uh, with an advanced concept like object-oriented programming. But basically, um, with, with object-oriented programming, of course, you get all the benefits of being able to set up some very efficient code um, templates. And uh, that's basically the way that most of the Panda 3D code is written if not all of it. And so you see here that this little code at the bottom basically sets up a, an object that is an instance of this PyOhio. That PyOhio is a class. And in that one class, you can wrap everything that you need that runs that game. Then the, after we instance that object, we merely retype the panda uh, command run. And it runs the um, runs our game. Here you see the little function or the method for that game at the end is called quit. And when we call that quit, we merely uh, do a system exit which just uh, kills the whole program. 
as you probably have encountered with other games. And here, um, here is the class, the, the, the definition of the class. It's called Pi Ohio, and it inherits from that direct object, dot direct object, in, um, inside the parents. And this underscore init underscore, there are two underscores there, is a function for the object that is called a constructor. And in here, we're going to be building our environment. We're going to be loading all the objects and all the rules by which we are going to be running our game. But we will encounter that in a little bit. Of course, with Python, I, th I, uh, I think that you've all been through a couple of uh, a versions of Python instruction. Everything's indented, right? And I actually like to teach Python before I teach the C++ class. Because as you might, may or may not know, with C++, you don't need to have indents, you don't need that, that strict programming structure. You can have everything on a single line with C++ and it would still compile. And the thing that I try and get across to my students is that when you're learning C++, you need to write not just for yourself, but for the people that take over the code after you. So Python is nice because it has a rigor. It has a rigorous format that you have to follow or it doesn't work. And I, I, like, I like that, um, oh, thank you. I like that basic structure. So um, again, I, I'm sure that in the Python classes that you've attended, you've encountered this about Python. And um, here is the uh, website. I believe that the, uh, this is, I put this on Google Drive. This is a link to um, that uh, Google Drive. And if you go on a web server, it will take you and you can download that zip file. And I believe this is in the notes on what you've just uh, uh, it, uh, downloaded from the flash drive. Okay. So, let me close this. And here's my intro.bat. This runs intro.py. I always use idle. Uh, there are plenty of good Python editors out there. I've just gotten become very accommodated to idle. I like idle. It's familiar to me. And um, one of these days, if I were to develop using Python in a more professional environment, I would probably go with something else. But idle is good for me right now. And here is idle. As you can see, we have, um, I have some functions here by which I uh, add instructions or I add a title. Here's our constructor. These will come into play later. How many here have encountered dictionaries with Python? Have you all been in introduced to that? I, I find them unbelievably uh, useful. They are probably the most useful um, structure that Python has. I use them all the time. Here, this code here, in our constructor here, Here's our constructor. In this constructor, I'm putting everything for now. Um, I add a title. It calls add title, and it puts the, the that function will return a basically uh, will put a simple title text string in the game, and I add these instructions. We're going to have the escape key is going to quit. Arrow up and arrow down is going to move in a positive and negative Y. Arrow right and arrow left are going to move positive left and right. Okay. And our simple command is um, load model. We call the, I should point out, that these libraries up here are all inclusive and they are not all used right now, but they will be used uh, in a little bit. But uh, these libraries are, are uh, used to import here, like our on-screen text, basically allows us to put text on the screen. Likewise, other libraries are responsible for including these uh, 
functions very much like this loader, load model command. Okay. So these objects uh, are loading an actual 3D geometry. Uh, basically because we, uh, I want to get into 3D games. This is not a pixel game. This is not like a, you don't use sprite sheets and things like that. This is an actual 3D environment. Even though by the time we're done, the client is, has a frozen camera that can't be moved. So it appears 2D. We just move in one plane. So we're going to move the, we got um, four cubes. Here, this is the method by which we bind a key to um, a particular action. Basically, the key is defined by a keyword called quit. And we, um, or I'm sorry, this is the, the, the function that's called that is defined, this self refers to our object, our Python game, and the quit method defined in that object. The escape key is a string sequence that is identified with the escape key. And the accept method, of course, it binds that key to that function. And of course, down here you can see where this quit is called, and it's merely right now just calls uh, the exit command, system exit. Okay. So if I were to run this, here's the batch file. I'm going to run that that Python script. And here you see, uh, of course, we, we the camera starts at zero zero zero, and um, oops, there we go. Here we have four squares that are placed at particular positions. We have the title down at the bottom here. And we have our instructions up there at the top. Okay. And our escape key works. Okay. So now let's get started with our, here again, stage one add objects. We're going to increase by uh, each stage. If you go into final code, you'll notice that uh, each one of these is the done or the finished version of the particular stage. Finally, when we get back, finished with stage four, we will have created two separate Python scripts, one for the server and one for the client. And we'll get into more of that when we get into multiplayer. Okay. So stage one, adding objects. Okay, so um, now the geometries are created in any number of 3D uh, modelers. Maya, Wings 3D, Blender. Um, usually they're exported into a number of different formats like Wavefront OBJ. There are certainly also primitives in Panda 3D that you can load in as a primitive object. But it's more, of course, people, when they uh, design a game, are not just designing for primitive objects. They're trying to d design some complex objects, even though I use spheres and cubes here. But it does extend the discussion to that what I've done is in Wing, I use Wing 3D primarily create a DirectX format, and then there is a conversion um, function on the, um, on the, the uh, um, this is, yeah, it's Panda, the Panda software, that this X to egg, egg is the supported format for Panda. It's the native format for Panda. But Panda can also call in directly the .x file as well. So I have created these spheres and cubes that have a texture map associated with them. And you can see them in the folder called Assets. Uh, in our constructor, we use the load model method to load a obj an object, either uh, an egg or some other format that is accepted by P uh, Panda. And you can see here that I have it. This is the... Um, 
kind of the command line notation for this dot says look in this current folder, look in the folder under that called assets, and then find something called sphere.a. Okay. By the way, I'm, I, if I tend to talk quickly, it's because I've, after giving this talk, I try to get through it as quickly as possible. Because I do want to ultimately get to that, to, to having us kind of put some machines together and watch the multiplayer at work. Now, the, um, okay. So here we have this reparent2. That basically tells the, uh, the rendering algorithm that we want to see this in the scene. If you didn't do that reparent to render, our object would not be seen. It's a nice way of having um, like parent objects that we can instance, which we'll see in a minute, but this is a way that you get your object in the scene and be it rendered. And here are the uh, utility commands of set position and set HPR. Panda has a system where the rotation around the object's center is, um, I always get this wrong, it's, um, let's see, there's uh, pitch and roll and H is not heading, but it's, um, yeah, uh, maybe yaw, but uh, H stands for something, it's not heading, and to tell you the truth, I dropped the name, but it's basically the three axes of orientation. This is H, this is pitch, and this is roll. And you control your, the uh, orientation of your object through those commands. And here we have the set color scale. Um, this is the four, uh, four tuple, red, see, red, green, blue. One is saturated in red, no green, no blue, so you got red. 1.0 means it's fully opaque. There's no transparency to it. You can adjust this between zero and one at the, the fourth value between zero and one, and you will get um, transparent values. Here's, a, here's how we're going to create an instance. We're going to create a barrier. We're going to, put it, we're going to create a circle of objects with a little opening at, the, at one side. Now, I welcome you to look at the math, but I won't go into it. R in this uh, in our formula stands for the radius. If we make this radius 50, it's going to be a big circle. If we make it 5, it's going to be small circle. And certainly you should, you know, experiment. Go in and change some of these values, see what you get. And here is the while loop, or the for loop. We're going to create 100 objects. I goes from 0 to 99. And we're going, this theta is a angular measure, a radian measure that is the difference between the, the object and the next object. And down here we are going to, uh, this last line here basically says we're incrementing our radian measure by 0 0.06. Well, what I did was I took the math and I said, well, I want a little opening at the end, so I don't want to go to um, the 6, one, or was it, 6, 2, 8, which is a complete circle. I want to leave a little opening there, so I'm only going to go to 5.9, have a little opening. Um, basically, we load this um, model of the sphere, and we put it with a, an uh, object in our game called parent. We set the position at 0, 0, 0, but we don't repair it to render. We don't want to see it. We just want it to be there as a resource because we are going to create these new nodes. We are going to place them, set position, and this formula here, um, I guess you can't see that off here, is basically this is the x coordinate and the y coordinate, a radius of 50, and we're going to put it in the zero z plane. Um, we create our, our red, green, blue here values, 
by creating random numbers. We call the random sequence in Python. And we create a random number between 0.6 and 1.0. I kind of cut out the lower red, the darker values between 0 and 0.6. And here I call the set color scale. Now these are white objects, so set color scale is going to multiply the white by the, uh, the appropriate color. If you were, had a black texture mapped object, you wouldn't get anything at all because black is zero and uh, zero times red or green or blue is zero again. So you, the set color scale is uh, something that um, you need to have the right kind of object. Now I could use the set color, but then the texture mapping overrides any set color command. So there's that to consider when you're making your objects. If you, want to, if you want an object that you can dynamically set the color in the code, then you should not texture map it. And then this last comment here, instance 2, basically I'm saying place the parent object and make it the, uh, the child, this node that we set up here. And with this render attached new node says, puts it under the render command, and we're going to be able to render it in the scene. And that's what it should look like. There's the small opening here. Because I, the, with the 0.6, 100 times 0.6 is, um, 0.06 is approximately 6. So there's that 0.28 difference between that and 2 pi. So we don't fill any objects in that part of the radian. Okay. Now, let me, um, I'm going to, where did I put my, so if we start up this, this is our start file. And if we start with this, Notice there's nothing there. So let me move on to the, that's, that's a start file. So you build your code, take a look at the code in the finish file, which is in, in stage two. And if I start this, There's what we have. Now I've maintained the camera movement in, in these scripts so we could look around, we can zoom in and out. Now notice there is, there, I don't have anything by way of, oh, I did a simple one here. I can move up, but I can't move down. I started with the, uh, with the discussion in stage two, I started with an example of how you could make your player move in a positive Y direction. So let's, let me bring up the, for those of you that use Linux, um, I apologize, I've been, um, for years, the majority of my professional career was in Linux, but when I started teaching at Columbus State, we are exclusively, or not exclusively, but primarily a Windows shop. And, and so I've, some of my files are named with blanks in them. So if you, I've been trying to switch over, get them back to a more reasonable uh, Linux approach where there are no blanks as, as it should be. Um, but if you find some, please uh, forgive me. I, I will get them all converted over. Now we're going to drive the player. So we have our, um, our player um, that is going to be a, um, one of our objects. And we're going, our input devices are the keyboard and the mouse. And each key has a tag name. Now in this little window here, this is still a part of our constructor here. I put these banners in the code so that you 
to locate a particular um, session that we're in. So this, again, we look at the self.accept, which is a uh, method under Panda. It takes two arguments. It takes one of the, a, a text string that identifies a particular key or mouse item, and it will assign it to a particular handler. So that when you click that mouse button or the key, it will call that um, function. And you see the value inside the, um, to the, uh, the third value is a list that has the value one. So it's sending a signal of one to this command. And then the, when the, uh, so in this case, the mouse left button, when it's pushed down, will send a value of one to this function. When the mouse is let go, when it's released, it sends a zero. Okay. So, um, again, this is, a, again, uh, just a statement of, of the uh, binding and the values that are sent that will make themselves evident here in a minute. So here is the function that we define still uh, within, but this is not within the constructor now. This is a function that's defined outside the init section. And it passes that value of one or zero to this key down. And here we have an if condition. If the value is one, if it's true, again, true is equivalent to the value anything non-zero. So the value one will produce a true, and it calls a, the a task manager, which is the uh, task manager manages all the software in between our game cycles. So a game engine is heavily uh, embedded with, um, with setting up um, a routine of render, then call the task manager to uh, handle any kind of the functions that we need, and then render again. And, and so there's that cycle that goes back between rendering and updating the environment. If this value, this key down value, right here, if it's zero, then we, um, we remove this, uh, this, uh, this from our, um, our task manager and basically um, then say that you're, we're not looking for that operation anymore. And um, the task is removed from the task manager. So this is a way by which that when we um, add that to the task manager, if we continue to hold down on the particular key or the mouse button, it repeats that operation over and over and over again. Here's the uh, move neg x that um, we set up. Actually, I'm setting, uh, uh, this is what is called when the, when the key is pu pushed, it sends a signal to a, um, our set x function for the, our player, meaning in the x direction, to pass a value of minus one, which means move to the left. The return task continue means that tell the task manager, continue doing this, don't remove it yet, until you get that zero, and then our uh, original code is, um, is then released uh, from the task manager. Now, here is a complete set of the commands that I've included for this particular game. We have um, the left and right keys are for moving in the negative x and positive x directions. They appear in pairs, of course. One sending a one to initialize it, zero, uh, for um, stopping it. 
And likewise, for the y direction, the down arrow produces a movement in negative y for the uh, player, uh, and up is a plus y. And so what I've done is very similar to this setup. I encourage you to complete the co code for the, uh, this game uh, with the other three, okay? with the other three directions. Now, um, the, the self.accept once is a way of communicating with the task manager that we're going to, we've removed, we're going to remove this task from the task manager and we're going to only do this one time and then we're going to stop. So these, the, this is kind of cleaning the buffer here. It says here, stop, set, uh, call neg x y or neg y, send one, do it just once, and then send the, um, um, the up arrow signal to neg y, sending zero just once, and that basically is an action of um, removing that task from our uh, task manager. Now, uh, there's a lot of, of communication in, in gaming, and this has to do, a lot of this has to do with non-blocking reads, that we don't want the action of pushing one key down to block other keys. We sometimes want to be able to push multiple keys. For anybody who's played a game, of course, you're always trying to duck and shoot at the same time, right? Or move diagonally or something. Pardon? Or move diagonally, like press W. Yes, you're right. And for our case, it would be the up arrow and the right arrow or left arrow would move in a diagonal direction. Yeah. Uh, and, of course, see if you can complete the code for moving down left or moving left or right. Okay. Okay, so let's see what, again, in our folder here, See where the um, I'm going to stop this game. And I'm going to go up into our our stage three because that has the code completed from stage two. And I'm going to start it. and move our, my camera to where we can see it working, rotate it. And now you can see that if I move up arrow or move the down arrow or move them both together, you get the diagonal movement that you were suggesting. Okay. But there's no collisions. That's the next important step in any game is to be able to have a collision method by which uh, there are um, 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 things that block you, things that stop you from going certain places. Okay. So, now, When I get through this, uh, our collision stage, I'll give you a short five minute break and then we'll come back and look at the multiplayer. Now with collisions, of course, are important. One, if you're doing a landscape game, you need your player to always land on the terrain and not fall through. When you have enemies, you want, or you want to fight your enemy, you want to be able to detect a collision with your enemy. When you go into a room, or if you go try to get into a house, you need to be collide with the walls, but yet be allowed to go through the doors. So collisions are a, a very, very important uh, quality. What's that? 
Um, puzzle games. Um, basically, uh, any any kind of the game that is like a first-person shooter, third-person game. Um, World of Warcraft, of course, uh, is a good example where you have just a lot of collisions going on in your environment. Okay. So the um, we are going to set up our collisions for our our player, and not only for our player, but also the barrier that we set up, and also for the um, the um, multi the other players that join our game. And uh, we are going to. Um, Basically, our, in any game engine, what you do is you're set, you can set it up so that if you have like a player that has a thousand polygons, you can set it up so that each polygon detects whether it's colliding with another polygon from another object. But this can be very cost prohibitive. So what we're going to do is we are going to set up simple geometries that will detect collisions and we'll still maintain somewhat of a shape of the object itself. Now, a lot of our collision um, software is going to be set up in the, um, the constructor function, the init function. And uh, these are going to be um, checking not so much if the individual polygons collide, but whether or not the simple object collides, which hopefully is a lot simpler algorithm to check than uh, the complex checking each polygon routine. Now we're going to set up, again, this is an individual object or an individual item that's set up within our game. Self is under object orientation, points to our game setup. Recall, uh, this is a name that you provide as a programmer, we'll call it pusher, because we call the collision handler pusher to define that particular object in our game. Now, the, what's nice about the pusher is that, that there are other kinds of collision handlers that um, I had at school. I had one of those bulbs blow on me. It just scared the dickens out of me. Um, the pusher is nice because what it does is when two objects collide, it pushes them back so that they're just touching. This is an algorithm that's defined in the code. You don't have to write it. But when two objects collide, they don't go through one another, quite simply. There are other kinds of collision handlers that you want to employ with more uh, complex games. But for our purposes, we just want to keep things from going through one another. What if you had it so that if you touch another one, you could cause it to move? Um, I think I've seen that, that behavior in this game, so we might, we might even see it when two people collide. But uh, basically, you can write that algorithm. It's not a simple pusher algorithm, because the pusher relates to the actual pushing on you back. So if you collide with something, it pushes you back until you're not colliding with it. But there are other more complex collision algorithms in Panda. Um, so to do this, we um, assign a collision solid, this, uh, a new node that's going to be associated with our, what I call the fighter, and a new node that's, that's going to be associated with our parent, and we call them here fighter C node for collision node and parent C node. And we attach a new node to our um, to our uh, scene graph. The scene graph is a hierarchical graph with nodes in it, and it just describes whatever is in our scene. So the attached new node means that it, this is a new node under the fighter that is a collision node, and I, call it, I tag it with C node 2, and the, the parent C node I tag with C node 1. But in a hierarchical nature, we have one player, what I call the fighter, and there's a sub-node off of that scene graph that is, um, that is always associated with that player. 
so that it, if it moves, then that collision node moves. And we set the radius here down here under this uh, sequence of commands. We, um, to that new node, we attach a collision sphere solid that has radius one. This is a radius that is just big enough to encompass the object. For our other node, C node and a radius of two. So it's a slightly larger collision node, gives a little more dimension to that node so, uh, so that you collide with it a lot sooner than you would with your uh, player. And the, the sphere is the simplest form of collision node because, oh, here, I'll let me talk. Uh, the, uh, the pusher collision, um, the uh, solid assigned to each object, the collision node uh, is attached to the object. Here I explain a little more about the hierarchy of the scene graph. And the solid is attached to the node and the sphere is the simplest one because to, um, let me go ahead a little bit, because the simplest way of detecting if two spheres collide is you use the simple algorithm, you find the Pythagorean theorem between the two centers of the spheres, and that's the distance between the two centers, and if the sum of the radii of both, uh, of both spheres is less than that distance, then you know they're intersecting. If they are, I should say, if they're, you know, if they're collided. Yeah, that's. I might, have, I might have worded that reverse. But when the two radii, you add the radiuses together and then see. Check, check them against the Pythagorean calculation. You add the two. You add radius two and radius one together, and then you compare that number to the, the distance. distance between the. Uh, the so when the distance is greater than the sum of the two radii, they're not touching. When that distance is less than the sum of the two radii, you know you have an they're intersecting. intersecting. And if they're identical, then they're touching. That's right. So, um, so that's why the sphere is the simplest form of collision node to use in 2D or 3D. And See where I am. Um, now we come to how we define who is pushing onto the other object. We define our our actor, our fighter, as the um, here in this pusher add collider right here is we want to check the fighter collision node and the fighter is our object that we operate on that if we have a collision that is seen as the into object so this fighter is colliding into and what it does is it searches every other object in our scene in our scene graph through this hierarchical scene graph to see if they're to check the collisions against every one so if you have a scene that has like a thousand objects in it, you know you have to have a fast algorithm to get that done within a clock cycle. And um, so that this, the sphere, of course, is ideal for that. Now there are other kind of collision solids like capsules, like if you have a person, instead of having check all the geometry in a, in a, a character, you could just put a capsule around it, like, a, like one of those medical capsules, and make it as big enough, just big enough so that it encompasses the character, and then you can move him around, and that, and that, that has a simpler, but not the simplest way of checking for collisions. And there are other, uh, there are planes, you can check for collision planes and other kinds of objects that uh, we, we don't deal with here, but they are covered in the manual. Um, so the objects, the, we have the into object, which is our character, from objects are included in the list of objects to check. Um, we create a traverser, 
which merely describes that this is how we're going to, it manages moving through the scene graph, checking all the collisions with everything else in our scene. Um, here we have, um, we said we described that the traverser should start with the render node. The render node is the topmost node in our scene graph, and this gets the traverser to uh, tra traverse through a particular part of the scene graph, if not the whole scene graph. And uh, with the traverser, we add this collider, we add the, um, the fighter C node, and the type right here, the type of, of, of collision algorithm that we're using here, the pusher. And here this command is a utility command. Uh, you can either show the collision node, I've, I've commented out this part here, which will always light up the collision node around an object with this show command, or you can just show the collisions that happen when they occur with this show collisions. And of course you pass the render node to that because again, the render node is the topmost node in our scene graph. What's going to happen when I collide? Oh, we'll see that in a second. Is it going to explode? Mm -hmm. awesome. Well, not quite explode, but we're just going to see something light up that tells us what's happening. So here's what the code looks like uh, for setting up collisions. It's quite compact, relatively. And again, it will be in the... If you go to the stage four networking, the start code here, uh, let's see, da, 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 da. Um, I thought I had a batch file in here. Hold on a second, let me get the, I'm just going to set up our batch code real quick. Here's what the batch file looks like. This points to the ppython code. And let's see, I think I called it um, stage 4 dash um, start dot pi. Let's save it. And I think I want to start the server. I'm going to start the... Um, stage 4 server. The reason I'm starting the server code is because there are certain setups that the server can do that the client can't do unless a server is running. So let me do that. Just to show this stage, I could have just as easily go over here, go into the done final code and do the stage three dot batch, which calls the done file. And let me just move my camera back a little bit. And if we start moving, there you go. Can't go through the barrier. Can't go from inside or from outside. And so if I can get focused in on that, just to show you some of the... If you see here, I'm lighting up the collision on the wall, and, and if you'll notice this little kind of rectangle right here, right next to our fighter, our, our moving object, that's, where, that's the point of collision. So Panda <coughs> allows, returns a, not only a collision, 
but the point at which you can coll that co collision is happening. Now, but in um, my the 3D games that we create in our uh, Panda class is that we actually get to firing missiles, detecting a collision between a missile and another object, and then blowing that object up. Okay, so so there there are some extended concepts that we cover in my uh, my Panda class that are beyond what we can cover here. But we use all this information. So, you know, if I wanted to, if this collided, if I just simply set up a collision and said, at the point of collision, um, create a particle effect that looks like something's exploding, and then make that, that barrier object disappear, destroy it. Okay. Then we could start, we have a, the, the beginnings of a game concept. All right. So, um, let me um, give you a break for about five minutes if you, if you need to. Okay, this is, the, uh, this is the networking part of the talk. We're actually going to create two different Python scripts. Now, um, with, uh, with network communication and gaming, we have two methods that are predominant in uh, the communication scheme. We have a client-server method, which basically has a uh, computer set in some location that is connected to the internet, and it is, its responsibility is to constantly monitor messages sent back and forth between the other, uh, what are called uh, the clients, or in this case, players. Whether you'd be at home or in the office or wherever you're playing the game and connected to like World of Warcraft, um, there are, so the server is solely responsible for all the information that is um, sent not only to the uh, getting information from the client, but informing other, the other players of the status of that client in their game. In other words, all of these, the, I've set the server up so he's a player as well. So all of these um, uh, clients and all these players know what everyone is doing in their game. Now know that you know, there's no one environment uh, that these are like, in this case, there are four separate environments on each machine, and you're hoping that your communication scheme is going to allow the, um, the timely information to be sent so that everyone sees everyone else in the correct position or in the correct activity. Okay, the other scheme is peer-to-peer. Uh, peer. In this case, in the previous case of server-client, the server has to have all the information, keeps, uh, keeps track of all the information that is going on in the game. In other words, this client reports, hey, I'm pushing my, my up arrow, so I'm going positive Y direction sends the message to the server every clock cycle. Then that, that server is informing all the other players, hey, player one is pushing, is moving in a positive Y direction, changing his uh, Y position with the up arrow. And this is going on every clock cycle. With peer to peer, or with peer, to peer all the clients are, there's no one server Every client has complete knowledge of everything that's happening in the game. So that play, this player is telling every other player, I'm pushing my edge up arrow. And then that player updates the information and in that particular environment on this machine, moves the player in that direction and so forth and so forth. So there's no one computer that's in charge of the game? That's right. That's right. Now, this adds a lot to the traffic um, that, especially in, in a number of players, this adds a lot more to the traffic and network traffic 
uh, and which is why a lot of times the um, the uh, client server method is a little, little simpler to um, maintain, simpler to set up, and more efficient to run. That's right. That's right. Or what will happen? It won't. It won't slow up your machine. If you've got a fast machine and someone on the network has a slow machine, it just means that you're going to be able to move closer to that person before they even know what's happening, and then you're going to get attacked and not even know it, and you're going to get knocked out of the game. So that's the um, the problem with the you know having. A variety and various resources on the network in a multiplayer environment. That's the challenge of running a multiplayer uh, game. So, um, first of all, the server. We're gonna we're going to do look at the server client client server um, relationship. Basically, the server sets up the communications node, the IP address, the um, a, a, a port number, which is kind of a software address on, the, on your machine. And it is responsible for allowing other players to access to the game. Um, it informs all the clients about a single player, whatever they're doing, changing position, or if they exit the game. These are the two activities that we're really involved in with this game. And the client basically just sends the server the information about themselves. Now the client is the client, of course, moves his own represent his own um, uh, player, yeah. but the server has to change that player's position on his game and send send that to the other client so they can do the same. So um, we're going to write two scripts for the game. Easier to maintain that way than rather putting it into. Um, into the same script. We are going to um, have a server script uh, with a separate configuration file. It has three lines of code in it, or lines of text. The uh, one that's the keyword is my ID, big kahuna. Server is a certain IP address. And the port number is a number that is somewhere in, I think that port numbers can get very large and I think that it's not too unusual for 60,000 or from zero to 60,000. Usually the first uh, 2,000 are reserved for very special functions and you can use those in the range of let's say 5,000 to 10,000. Okay, so the server address is an actual position or an, an actual address on the network using the domain name server and all that stuff, and it'll actually get it to your machine. Then on your machine, the server is going to say, communicate through this address, this software address, which is the port number. And that is, after the server sets up that port number, that is reserved for that game. Now the command, if you go to the, um, the command window, and you just type CMD in that start window. You get this kind of a window here where you can type command line code. Um, you don't need to do this if you're the client. You just need to know the server number, the server IP address and the port number. And this is using the command IP config as a way of getting the port number of your machine. Now what I'm, I'm saying is that um, it's very easy to set up a, uh, a LAN party. All you need is a hub or a switcher like that. And unfortunately, that only has five ports. But you can get, uh, they're very inexpensive. You could get like 10, 12 ports. So you can have 10 or 12 people at your house playing a multiplayer game. But someone has to be the server. And so that the server uh, in their config file, which I'll show you in a minute, we'll put uh, next to the server is that four, uh, that dotted decimal number, the four numbers that represent certain address locations in internationally on the internet. 
I won't go into the IP uh, each, address. Each of those four numbers can go all the way up to, I think it was 255. That's right. Each of these numbers is represented by an eight, uh, eight positional binary number. And that eight, um, uh, those eight bits can go from 0 to 255. And so that limits the, uh, how many machines you can have in a certain location. This usually is rep reserved for a particular machine. So uh, when we look at my network here, uh, we will get a unique IP address for this particular. It will automatically assign an IP address just on this um, hub. It, uh, it's not connected to the internet. It just generates a local list of, of host numbers. Which means over, which means locally you can have up to 255 computers, but it gets all weird once you get 256. Yes. Well, you can't represent 256. If you try to enter that, it'll give you all sorts of problems when you try to read in that as an IP address. That's right. That's, right. That's why it's very important to get the IP address correct. And so the client script, the configuration file, should have a separate ID. And anybody who's registered for a multiplayer game is familiar with the routine of registering, paying your money, and then say, okay, now choose an ID. And that comes back and says, well, you can't use that ID. It's, not, it's being used. Because the ID is what is used to identify each of the individuals in that network game. And this server number should be the same as the one on the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the number that is set up that is the IP address of the server and the same port number. Now, these list of tags are important in our game because we're going to invent a method by which we're going to create um, we're going to create packets that are going to be sent back and forth between the machines. And we are going to identify them with these simple digits, these tags, and the title, these, uh, these uh, text strings, msg, none, author, auth, pose, quit, c quit, c pose, have a particular meaning when they're being interpreted. So we'll be using those when we are sending our passages and decoding them uh, when we receive them. Um, we use dictionaries. Python dictionaries is a very efficient way to keep information. Um, the the um, server keeps a client's dictionary, which keeps a key value pair that is the um, IP address of the connector, the, the client, and the, the code name, the, um, the ID name. Okay. Well, actually, it's, uh, I'm sorry, I, I misstated that. Um, it's the uh, IP address and the connection over which that IP address is connected. The player list is basically by uh, player ID. So you have your ID name, and then you have um, a certain information like it's an information that's coded that in our game is represented by position, X, Y, Z. Well, Z is zero all the time, so just X, Y. Um, models is a list of what kind of model is being represented by that player. So we can have uh, a player enter the game with a different model than just the sphere. Collision spheres and collision nodes are important because these are the collision information that we're going to fill in for uh, that player, that, that player in the game, so that we can comply with that player. So the same thing that we set up for the player that we did under collisions, we're going to set up when a new player gets added. Now the code for this is placed in the constructor, and the last command that we create is this command that is a function that we write that's called init network, and we'll look at that in just a second. Init network is the both in the server and the client code. It sets up the, the connection manager. 
okay, which basically manages all of the low-lying connections over the internet. Uh, the connection listener, which listens, which is just used by the server to listen for people wanting to get into the game. Uh, the connection reader, this this um, from the so from the uh, network sockets reads all the packages that are coming into the game, and um, it queues up all of the datagrams, and these they're called datagrams in in Panda uh, to be read. And Panda has a low level library of support for creating these datagrams and for setting up all the network sockets. And we also have to have a write uh, can, uh, process where we can write and, and create our datagrams and then set, send it to the server. Now the two functions to, that we are creating in, set, in our separate files is we have a start server function and a start client function, each in the respective Python code. We'll take a look at those in a little bit. Um, so. The manager opens up the TCP connection. Now this is all, I, I should note as an aside, this is um, in the manual for Panda. Um, and I realize I'm, I'm running through this uh, very quickly so that I don't run out of time and keep you too late. But um, basically the manager is again, the one that handles all the low, lie, low level stuff on the networking uh, level. And basically the listener uh, adds the connection to a TCP socket, which is one of the methods of connections. Like there's TCP and UDP. TCP requires what I call a handshake. When a message is sent, that the person that sent the, the um, process that sent the message waits for an acknowledgement that the, the message arrived. UDP doesn't do that. UDP just sends it and doesn't care. It just goes on which is why UDP is used more in uh, games than TCP because there is that time feature. But it's less secure. With UDP, you're not always sure that you get that the client that who has sent that message receives it. Um, so basically, the client, um, the, the client and the server, when they get an information about a new player, adds the player, uh, first of all, the, uh, the player adds themselves to the player list. Okay, and notice that um, this is, again, the uh, self.myid is a key to the player list, and the value is that sextuple of values. In other words, that's XYZ position and uh, HPR rotation. So we're basically telling that, that we're setting ourselves up at the uh, zero, zero, 001 in our game. One is the Z lofted value or the, in the Z direction. Uh, the key would be, in this case for the server, would be big kahuna. And the value is a list of values that we can send to our clients that says, this is where I am. Um, So the uh, network section code starts the server, adds the tasks to the task manager. That This task manager, again, remember, is running every cycle. So it's always listening, always wanting to write. It can, it's ready every clock cycle after the render. It's ready to act. Um, it a executes the registered functions in the server to listen. And again, the listen task is only for people that want to add the game. The clients and the server, after the, um, after the server acknowledges someone wants to start the game, then informs everyone of a new addition, and then after that, it's always reading and writing. Reading and writing. The listen task is always for new, new people coming in. Okay, and so starting the client, we open a TCP connection. We, uh, we get the IP address and the port number from our configuration file. There's a little piece of code that opens a file and then reads the information. 
and if we create a spawn point for that player, randomly place him at X and Y, um, and placing the Z at zero. I guess my, my slide was incorrect with putting Z at one before, so that might be a, an edit point. We create, uh, basically the, uh, the client requests permission to get into the game, uh, sending a datagram, at the top is that is a special code number for authorization. And these are what the datagrams look like. Um, we create a datagram called, here we could just give it the name DTA. It is initialized here and then we add these values in order to our datagram. We can add unsigned integers, 16-bit. Python, our Panda has the ability to add 8-bit and 16 and I think 64-bit integers, as well as uh, strings and floats. That's the name float64. So here we add a key code number that is going to basically tell what kind of message this is. Here we're, we're saying that this is of the authorization type we're looking for authorization into the game. Uh, we give the player ID, which would be Rampage if you're a client, you say, and you open up your configuration file and, and it interprets your ID as Rampage. Um, this is entered here as a string. And then our XYZ and HPR information are the floats. The uh, network section code uh, starting the client, we send a request and join the game. Uh, only the client send the type of message that is MSGAUTH, authorization. This is, this is interpreted by the server as someone who wants access to the game. Um, the server adds the player to the player list. And the, uh, the server is the only one to receive this authorization type of message because then the server is going, once he grants access to that client, is going to send a message saying, here's a new player to all the other clients. And um, so in the event-driven cycle, we push a key, we move a player, we rotate it. <clears throat> and uh, then we, uh, at the end of that, we inform the server that this has changed the server then informs everyone else, updates his own environment. And the net network section code, uh, basically we update the model and we create, um, let's, see, let's say we push the arrow right. We basically, um, we create, if you can see down here, we create a datagram. And then we add this special um, special variable in here <coughs> that says this is of a type where the client is moving. The server receives it. The string is my ID because this is how we, we locate that player in our dictionaries by the ID. And then we interpret this as the new XYZ HPR. The server updates its own information in this table. And um, oh, here, here's, the, um, here's the server side over here. Basically, he gets the string, gets all the floats, updates his own in, uh, data. And um, basically gets, uh, updates his own data and then set, blasts a message to all the other clients or all the other players. The, um, the escape key is very simple. You just push the escape key, you create a, a datagram that says the client is quitting, add your ID, send it to the server, and the server informs everyone else that that client is quitting. And here we get, uh, here is simply the get string on the server part. We just get the string 
and we interpret the, um, the name of the person who's quitting. We basically remove him from all the dictionary lists and destroy his, his uh, player geometry, basically just delete it. Pardon? She said she was just about to ask the same question. Oh, okay. Oh, you mean about if you quit, let's say a player quits. Now, if the server quits, then the clients have to know how to handle that because they, basically you've lost all connection with the server. But if a client quits and then wants to rejoin the game, you basically start the game all over and you start at that same spawn position. Or actually, you don't start at the same one. You randomly, you can either start at a particular position or you can randomly choose one. Now, I've chosen the algorithm that we just randomly choose a position somewhere out there and um, basically um, the, um, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, basically, yeah. So you, you don't come in at the same position, but you do get, get, get access. You can... Um, Request access again if you want to. Now, um, I think it's time to leave the PowerPoint. And let's see if we... Um, let's see, I'm going to see if I, got, if I have a, an Ethernet cable. I'm going to set this machine up as a server. And then I'm, I'm going to welcome anyone to come on up here. There's another one of my machines here that we can start. Uh, we just got to get the right IP address. I'm not sure if I have a, something long enough that I can reach over there. I wanted to be able to project it. I wonder if I can move this over. Oh, there we go. Start it off uh, hmm? this, this machine. Pardon? You were going to start. So let's see what um, see what we can match. Window management's always a challenge with me. Okay, 169, 254. Okay, I had I ran this previously. So this is the number um, that you would type in to the client configuration file, which is 3D network underscore client. If you open up an editor, you want to put that number right here. What did I say it was? Excuse me one second. Let's see, 169, 169 169.254 dot 54 dot 174 okay so that should be and then of course you make up your own name big kahuna is mine so you can't have that but like rampage or I would suggest you come up with your own name like Bob or or Ted or Sally or something like that all right pardon you sure can so why don't we? So I'm going to save this on the client code, and let me just uh, let me get this running because these are already Etherneted together. Let's see if we can get something running here. So, what code are you running? I'm, I'm trying to get code running just to see if it will run. Uh, now you can run the server code. Run the server.bat file. Oh, I was doing that start stage four start. No, go to the, uh, I'm sorry, that, that basically just has the Python code that has gaps in it. Okay. It's the, it's the completion code from stage three. So if you go into the final code folder and you double click the server, it'll run without any, but, without, but if, you, if you want to get the client, you have to get the client code running. So on, on your machine, if you go to the folder and you select, I'm going to find it now. 
So go into the final code, edit the um, 3D network underscore client. However, you know, you can use Notepad or whatever. And of course, the 169, 254, 54, 174 is the, um, is the server IP address. Okay, so I got that on here. And now I'm going to... First of all, you have to start the server. And let's see, where is that? So start with the, the stage four server.batch. And now again, when the client comes up, you're gonna find that it's a fixed camera. You can go into that code and change that. So let's say here I have the server's running. Okay. And let me move this over slightly so you can see some of the message. As you can see here, this, the, some of the commands I gave in the server code are to spit back the IP address, the port number, the ID, big kahuna, and when it got into the initialization code, and then when it got into the server, or when the server was started. Now, I haven't gone into the Python code yet. I thought I'd, I'd get the game started. And then, um, so let's see if we can get the client started. Okay. So now, I don't know if you can see him, but there's that little blue square up there. That's the, this guy over here. You can, if you want to, you can come on up and just the, just the four arrows. So basically, let me see if I can get that, that guy to come on down. Go ahead. See, here's there. And here you're colliding. There you go. There you go. No, you can't. You can't get me. Actually, when I introduced this to my students just to do networking, um, I, th I thought, well, this is not going to be a game. But immediately the classroom erupted by they, they like four of the students blocked the entrance to the fifth student. So they already, they, you know, <laughs> They're, they're, let's make this into a game kind of concept that immediately came forward. Now, um, so if you, if you want to, come on up, and I'll leave this running. But the, um, I know that there's a lot of complex concepts that are going on here. And um, it is, in, in a given amount of time, it's very difficult. You try not to hit me and see if you can move me. Yeah, the collision thing is too big. Yeah, it is. I'm not, you're, but still, I, I don't think you're going to be able to move me. Here, I'll tell you what, this little thing I noticed... Okay, now try and run into me. Yeah, I, I think I observed that. The unfortunate thing about doing this is that I have to set up two machines and play myself all the time. So uh, I, I thought I observed that where one of the, uh, the server actually was pushing the other player around, but I might have been mistaken. This is me just hitting the same key. Pardon? There you go. 
Now, the thing about the pusher collider is that if you are hitting not perfectly at the normal, in other words, they're not perfectly aligned with the collision sphere of the other player, you will not move anywhere. But if you hit slightly off, then you'll slide along the geometry uh, until that you, you, know, you, get, you get away from that resistance. Thank you. So, um, basically, I want to show... Hold on a second. Let me open up. Real quick, I want to review the code just so if you go back and you look at this. Here's the server. Well, whenever I am apparently right in between your character, it's, it's actually a bit inside the wall thing. So if I turn and position my character in between your character and the wall, mm -hmm. it moves out of the way. Ah, my player did? My no, his. Oh. He can't position it exactly. It looks like it's moving one way or the other. Yeah. That uh, basically is the is the configuration of the of the collision nodes. But here is just as a quick review. Here with the server, uh, basically um, here is the um, config file read. This basically uses Python to read in. Um, looks for the keyword my ID. Strips blanks away from it. And then uh, it splits where the equal sign is, making two arguments. And the second argument, which is, is um, indexed by one, is set to my ID. So that's the string part, uh, the rampage or big kahuna. Uh, the server is a string that is, um, that is um, again, split at the equal sign, and so is the port number. And those are saved under these special, um, here's the print statement. Again, this is uh, Python 2 uh, syntax, which is no parents around the print argument. Because Python, our Panda, just supports uh, 2.7, or 264. And uh, then down here is when you start getting into the code, when you look for the code, Notice that this is all the stuff that sets up the um, event handlers, the key pushes and the motion. And then we uh, set, here's the collision. And this is the last command. We call the function ne init network, which is after these codes here for the functions that handle the movement. And here's a net network. And here you see quite simply, the, it starts the manager, the listener, the reader, and the writer. Again, the listener is the only one that the, um, is solely owned by the server. And then we start the server by calling start server right here. And this is where they set up the socket information. I'm using TCP socket. Now, Panda also supports UDP sockets. And, um, you know, it's, it's something that you can experiment with. I just use TCP sockets because they're more secure. You know, you're, you're certain that the messages are getting back and forth. <clears throat> um, and here's where, we, um, here's where we add a connection. We make a connection of that TCP socket. The, um, we assign these negative values, assign the priority of our tasks. Minus 40 is more of a priority than minus 39 in Panda. The lower you go in the negative, no, or the lower you go, the greater the priority. Yes? Can you think of any situations where a UDP packet would be preferable to a TCP? Most game situations. As long as you're sure that you're not really worried about if you drop packets. Okay. You know, in other words, when a game clock is updating at a, at a rate of, let's say, 1,000 cycles per second, which is not unusual, then, um, then you're probably going to have a packet that will be added at some point that will correct the information if, if one is lost. Yeah. 
But, um, but certainly that's the problem, is it, it drop packets. UDP does not detect that. Yeah. So you just got to make sure you design to allow that. Right, right. Um, and uh, so here's the listen task, which again is just the server. I, um, I won't. Um, sets up a rendezvous point uh, with the net address and then creates a pointer to the connection. And so here, let's get into the, uh, some other stuff too. The read task is important where you um, basically uh, set up a datagram um, and the read task basically reads in these datagrams and um, <clears throat> this calls the function datagram handler down here to interpret the datagram. And in here in the non-blocking read, what happens is packages are sent away to this function so that they can be unpacked. And this is where we get all the code that and I, I welcome you to look at, this is the heart of the matter. This is the, these are the brains of the game. If you get a message ID, if you get like an authorization request, the server handles it this way. It gets the player ID. It puts that player ID in the dictionary clients. And it associates the last connection. In other words, this is a connection that is identified with that player ID. So you always know by the player ID what the network connection is. And here, this is very important. We call a function called update clients, which again is a fun when you look at the code later on, it's just a simple loop that says for everyone in your client list, send this message. If it's, a, if it's a client position that's changing, you basically, um, and as long as it's not your own ID, because you're already updating your own player, um, you unpack the information using the get method. You set up a list of that information, and you um, update that player ID, and that, remember that list of XYZ HPR? That's the value you're putting in that dictionary under player list. And um, that's why I, I did this 2D game, because when you get into 3D, you're getting into a lot, of, a lot more um, uh, kinds of messages and datagrams that can be sent. Um, here is the um, update server, so that... Um, we, um, these are, um, uh, this is a datagram that is created um, by the uh, client position. And basically for um, each, here's the for loop that for every client in our client's dictionary, we send, we call the C writer send, and we send that datagram called DTA to that client. For everyone. Update clients is uh, another message that is sent where um, the uh, basically the server is trying to update all the other clients from um, about his change in position. So we broke it up into two things. Server gets an information in from a client, informs all the other clients. Server changes his own position, then you update all the other clients after you've updated your position information. And update world uh, basically um, is something that basically is done every clock cycle so that every player in the dictionary is, um, is basically um, updated to everyone else. Okay, so we send whatever the current information for that player is. Um, if he's in the uh, mo if the um, if the models has a key, that means he has there's a player list. We uh, set um, the uh, 
the information, set X, set Y, set Z, and so forth, uh, from that information about the player. And this part of the code is where we actually, if there's a new player being added to the game, um, again, the load model, it's a cube this time, so I loaded a cube as, as the, um, in, in the local game on my machine, all the other players will look like cubes, I look like a sphere. I forget what the client code looks like. We set the color scale, we do the collision sphere, uh, attach um, the collision nodes, reparent to render so that all the client, everyone is renderable. And um, we set the, um, the player list uh, to, the, uh, to our uh, local variable, and we, um, we set the um, various, the respective XYZ positions to that particular model. Again, this part of the code is if someone new is being added to the game under update world. And then we call update server, which basically is, again, is responsible for the server to send everyone else a message. Every client in our clients list will be updated as far as their new positions. Okay. Um, I know there are a ton of questions. Uh, I know it's a lot to, to set in. But um, basically, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun to set up these multiplayer games. And um, that's about it. So you ended up in after all. I did. I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out where I, 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 maybe I, maybe I talked too fast. Maybe I should have spent more time. But I'm sure after a full day of Python, you're ready to go home. But if you, if you do, if you have any questions, uh, in the notes, I believe, is my IP, or IP address, is my email at Columbus State. You're more than welcome to email me if you have any questions about anything specific, if you want to, get, if you want to go in this direction. Oh, thank you. Yes. There's a... That Google Drive address is on the PowerPoint that you downloaded off of that thing, too, I suspect. No, it wasn't. Oh, it isn't? Oh, oh it's okay. not? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, I know that they were going to put it on the... Um, what do you call it? Uh, on the PyOhio oh, site. Um, that might not be up for a day. I'll tell you what. Uh, email me, and I'll send it to you. All right? I might have done something it's on right. Your slides, though, isn't it? it is on my. I might have. What I did is put the zip file on Google Drive and then got the link and put it in the slide. So I might have to email you all if you wish to have it. But um, but definitely email me and I'll send it to you. Here, you want me to want me to bring up that slide so you can see it? Let's, hold on a second. 